So our next guest doesn't really need to be introduced because I'm sure you all know exactly who he is. I'm talking, of course, about the renowned author, scholar, and fearless freedom fighter, as far as I can see him, and that is Robert Spencer. Please welcome Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this very special part of our conference. We have a very special guest, and I know you will know our special guest who has been with us before and who is an absolute expert on the topic that we're going to discuss now. Now, we've had an incredible year, as you know, and we've talked a lot about the incredible year. And things have happened this year that have put us in a different place, completely distracted us, if you like, from major issues that are still there and still in the background, and we still need to deal with them. And it's still the issue that other political parties won't address. And if they do, they address it with appeasement and with lies and with sanitization. And you know, from what I'm saying, you know the topic that I'm talking about. I'm talking about Islam. It hasn't gone away. This topic, we've been immersed in coronavirus the whole year. This hasn't gone away. And we had a stark, well, a few stark reminders this year that it hasn't gone away. And those reminders were in France. We know what happened there, but let's discuss them in a bit more detail uh, and get a view of also something else that's happened this year, which is the US presidential election. Uh, welcome, please. I know you know who he is. We're honored to have his support and have him with us again today. Uh, Robert Spencer. Robert, thank you ever so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with France. We've had, France has had another one of those years, hasn't it? And, and we had a, we had another attack on what they, the attackers thought was Charlie Hebdo's headquarters. Um, not a fatal attack on that occasion, but then we of course had the horrific beheading, beheading, just even to say the word is shocking, beheading of a teacher. Uh, and then further beheadings after that. Uh, first thing I want to ask you about that, Robert, is if you could take us through the theology of it. So why are cartoons so controversial? I know we discussed this briefly before, but I think we should go over it again. Why are the cartoons so controversial? And why is beheading a method of execution, punishment, theologically? Well uh, the second part first, the Quran says in chapter 47, verse 4, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. And so this prescribes beheading as the preferred method of execution for an unbeliever. Now, the unbelievers in question are not actually just any unbeliever at all. It has to be someone who is a kufar harbi, a infidel at war with Islam. And you place yourself at war with Islam by violating various tenets of Islamic law. For example, Islamic law stipulates that there is the death penalty prescribed for an unbeliever who mentions something impermissible about Muhammad, the Quran, or Islam itself. Now that includes visual representation. This is a bit paradoxical because particularly in the Shiite Muslim tradition, there has been representation of Muhammad in the past. However, nowadays it is considered by most Sunni Muslims to be ipso facto blasphemous and consequently the death penalty for blasphemy as well as the death penalty for infidels who mention something impermissible about Muhammad are both applicable. So consequently somebody who draws Muhammad has committed blasphemy, has mentioned something impermissible about him that is subjected the prophet of Islam to mockery and ridicule and thus the death penalty is entirely justified from the standpoint of Islamic law. What's your view Robert on uh, Emmanuel Macron and his response because he came out strongly first of all and said we will defend our cartoons etc. He is now backpedaling on that because essentially because the Muslim world turned against him. I mean, what is your view on this extraordinary situation that we have people beheaded in France for essentially being French, and yet the world turns against France? I mean, is this, what are we, what are we watching here? What are we witnessing here? What is, what is going on? How can, how can it all be so upside down? Well, the freedom of speech was 
first given protection in Western societies as the foundation of the idea that the society would be free. Now, what's lost nowadays has been exactly what it means to be a free society. And this is no longer valued in France, in Britain, in the United States to a tremendous degree, a degree that very few people realize because we just take for granted that a society is and forever will be free and ought to be free. And yet at the same time, people hold these contradictory positions that various uh, groups ought to be protected from criticism, various uh, people ought to be uh, stopped when they speak certain things that are considered offensive. What it means to have a free society is essentially that you can speak what you believe without fear of violent reprisal that what is protected in the society is precisely the freedom of opinion and the freedom of expression. That's what makes a society free. But nowadays, the idea that one has offended a group that is considered to be uh, deserving of special protection, and this is particularly Muslims in France, in Britain, in the United States, in Canada, and elsewhere, then uh, these people ought to be protected from being offended. And now that cuts against the very idea of what a free society is and creates Muslims as a protected class that can therefore do whatever it wishes because it's walled off from criticism. And that means it's given essentially a license to jihadis who are within the Muslim community to do whatever they wish. So the uh, backlash that Macron has experienced after saying that France will stand up for the freedom of speech, comes from the by now deeply ingrained idea in the West that Muslims have been subjected to particular discrimination and harassment, and that consequently they're deserving of special protection, and that that includes a protection from criticism. So the uh, cartoons have to be outlawed. He has been completely inconsistent in this, in saying that France will stand up for the freedom of speech. And then Rasmus Paladin from Denmark went to France to burn a Quran, and he was arrested and deported because he had violated the idea that Muslims should be safeguarded from this kind of insult and ridicule. Of course, if Rasmus Paladin had gone to France and burned a Bible, then nobody would be upset in the least. And everyone would agree that this is an essential aspect of the freedom of expression, that Christianity can be subjected to this kind of harsh criticism and even ridicule and mockery, and that this is ne necessary and essential for the society continue to continue to be free. But nowadays, when it comes to Islam and Muslims, the, this very idea has been lost and people are ready and willing and even eager to throw out the basic principles of what makes a society free in order to placate those who would be violent in the face of criticism. I mean, do you think, uh, Robert, that it's a, it, to me, it's a mixture of two things. One, the demands of Islam, and two, the loss of our freedoms generally. And to my mind, we, the Western world is going to the left, and by, by which I mean the extreme left, the totalitarian left, the shutting down of freedom of speech in general. To my mind, Islam has taken advantage of that fact. It is using the left-wing racist card at every opportunity. Um, and so it's, it's, it's almost a perfect storm. You've got a demanding religion and a weak society mixed. And we've, as you say, we've lost our, our will for freedom, our understanding of freedom. We've had many stating in Europe for a long, long time so that people don't even understand their independence from the state is so important. I mean, would you agree with that? Do you think it's a, it's a, it's a toxic mix? of things and, and can we get out of that mix? Yes, there's no doubt that's absolutely true and very important. And it's also the underlying reason why Islamic groups and leftist groups are such uh, close allies. When mm. you would expect that because of differing issues of morality and various other things that they would be at odds, they work together very well because both of them have essentially a totalitarian worldview that the, uh, paradise can be achieved in this world, the perfect society can and should be achieved in this world, and that's achieved by means of brute force, that those who dissent are to be forcibly silenced and uh, brutalized if necessary, or even killed in order to make them submit. That is, of course, how the far left has always worked whenever it's gained power. In Russia, 
in China and everywhere else where uh, communists have come to power, we have seen that they behave in this way. And that also is the way Sharia works, that Sharia is based on the idea that the perfect society is modeled after, is uh, patterned after Islamic law, is based on Islamic law. And those who, of course, violate Islamic law are to be beheaded or have their hands cut off or various other things that are uh, these brutal punishments mandated by Sharia. So Islam in its uh, legal aspect and the far left come together precisely in that totalitarian imperative. Now, can it be resisted only if there is a uh, large scale understanding, a large scale awakening to the very well established idea that total government control over the lives of individuals is actually uh, life destroying and is uh, the cause of a, an appalling amount of human misery over the last few centuries. Uh, can this be recalled? Well, I think there are signs of hope, even though it looks as if uh, President Trump has not been reelected. The, nonetheless, there's a movement of 70 million Americans who voted for him, who uh, agree with him and his repeated proclamations that America will never be a socialist country. Uh, that's going to come down to the test now in the coming few years. And we're going to see how much those 70 million are committed to that idea and what they're willing to do and to sacrifice in order to protect America as a free society. But the very fact that Trump was able to be elected the first time, the fact that Brexit was able to be voted in in Britain, even though politicians since then have been doing their best to make it a null, uh, uh, empty letter proposition. Nonetheless, these are signs that there are uh, large numbers of people who are not willing to submit to the totalitarian boot on the face and will resist. And so uh, how it will go is anyone's guess, but it's not going to be an easy thing, I do not believe, for either country to be completely destroyed in this way. Uh, thank you. I, I think it's a, it's a crucial point to make that the left is in bed with Islam and for that and for the reasons you've just described. Let's talk about President Trump. He is still President Trump for the time being. What's his legacy in this regard? I mean, he came in, like you say, before the election, he said, I think Islam hates us. I remember this. It was, it was, it just, it made me, it made me sing with joy just to hear someone so senior in politics say such a thing. Four years we've had him in the White House. What's his legacy in this regard? Has he achieved anything in terms of pushing back Islam? What has he achieved? Will it carry on? Well, there's no doubt that if you look at the rate of jihad terror attacks in the United States from 2009 to 17, and then compare that to the rate of jihad terror attacks in the United States from 2017 to now, there's a big difference. There's a remarkable drop off. And I believe that that is a test, a silent testimony to the fact that Islamic jihadis have understood that Trump means business in regard to stopping them and that they have to bide their time now. Uh, I do believe that it's virtually certain that uh, a Biden presidency, a Kamala Harris presidency, will result in an extraordinary new uh, rate of jihad terror attacks in the United States. There will be a sharp spike in that jihad terror activity in the United States because the jihadis see the world in terms of strength and weakness and they see Trump as strong and they see Biden and Harris as weak. That's as, uh, as simple as it is, that's all there is to it. Now, as, as much as that is true, at the same time, there has not been a great deal of progress during the Trump administration in regard to changing the perspective of the counter-terror and foreign policy establishments. They were committed when he took office to the idea that Islam was a religion of peace that had nothing whatsoever to do with terrorism, and that therefore the counter-terror establishment ought to be dedicated to stopping Islamophobia, which they see as the cause of any jihad terror attacks that do occur, and to a fantasy right-wing extremism that exaggerates the threat of a tiny minority into a threat that is comparable to or even equivalent or greater, equivalent to or greater than the jihad terror threat. And that, unfortunately, has continued. 
as we have seen the so-called deep state uh, resist Trump's policies with uh, everything they possibly have been able to do. And so the foreign policy establishment and the counter-terror establishment that Trump inherited is still largely in place. And now it will just uh, be all the more emboldened to dismantle whatever vestiges there are of actual resistance to jihad terror activity. And how, how entangled, let's talk about the Democrats as a party first, how entangled with, for want of a better expression, I suppose, with jihadism? How, I mean, for example, the Labour Party here is awash with Muslims, extreme, I mean, it's as extreme as it gets, uh, and unashamedly so. Is that the case with the Democrats? Uh, are, they, are they in bed with care, for example? in the way that the Labour Party would be in bed with Islamic organizations here. What are the Democrats like in this regard, generally? I don't believe that it's, far as, it's as far advanced in regard to the Democrats as it is with Labour, but certainly it's the exact same thing. Uh, Kamala Harris, who's likely to be president by this time next year, is uh, taking advice regularly from the Council on American Islamic Relations. And Biden, of course, promised to engage, which is another Muslim Brotherhood group, that he would appoint Muslims at every level of his administration. It's virtually certain that the Muslims he will appoint will be Muslim Brotherhood operatives because all the major Muslim groups in the United States care, the Islamic Society of North America, the Muslim American Society, all the rest of them, they're all linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. And we have to remember, of course, that according to a captured internal document about the Muslim Brotherhood activity in the United States, the brothers' uh, goal is eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers. By their hands, that is the hands of the Westerners, the non-Muslims. They will be made to sabotage their own house. And I think the Democratic Party's eager collaboration with these Muslim Brotherhood operatives is a primary indication of how the West is going to be made to destroy itself. Absolutely, and, and, and you know, they, they, we would not, they would not be doing this if we weren't facilitating it. Of course. They simply wouldn't would be able to get away with it. We've given them all the power that they have. They would not be able to do it if it were not for the left in Britain and the United States being so solicitous of Islamic groups and so eager to appease and accommodate them, then they would have no influence. Uh, if the authorities in both countries stood up for the principle of one law for all and enforced the idea that if you are in Britain or in the United States, you have to believe in the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the equality of rights of all people before the law, particularly the equality of rights of women, the equality of rights of non-Muslims, you have to not be anti-Semitic, all these other things that are contradicted by Sharia. If our authorities stood up for all that, then there wouldn't be any problem then people who would not or could not do that would be deported or would never have come in the first place. And the Muslims who were here would be sincere in their acceptance of Western values. But instead, there's the big, uh, become generally accepted the idea that uh, to oppose Sharia, even in its most inhumane forms, even in the forms, in the aspects of it that most clearly contradict Western values, is Islamophobic and racist. That's why we're in the fix we're in. Absolutely, absolutely depressing. It's depressing. I mean, after, like you say, we had four years of Trump and nothing, well, little catastrophic happened during that time, but it's gonna take more than four years to push this back and to push back against, as you put it, the, the, the deep state and as Trump puts it. So you, you mentioned that Kamala Harris will be president by this time next year. That really, uh, that quickly? Well, I'm no prophet, but uh, I, I do think that there are signs. Uh, there are interesting indications of what the Democratic Party's plans are. They have been rather forthright, as a matter of fact, about some of the things they intended to do. For example, Nancy Pelosi, a few days before the election, said that it will look as if Trump has won on election night but we're confident that Biden will prove the winner and be inaugurated on January 20th, which was a little bit of a slip that 
they were planning to steal this election in just the way that they've done uh, by bringing in this inundation of uh, fake absentee ballots and mail-in ballots that tipped the scales to Biden in many of the key states, uh, even though it looked as if Trump was on his way to a comfortable victory on election night. Another time when I believe Pelosi tipped her hand was in October when she introduced legislation that would make it a great deal easier for the 25th Amendment to the Constitution to be implemented, which allows for the vice president to become president if the president is incapacitated or unable to perform his or her duties in the judgment of the vice president and of Congress. Now, she said at the time that this was not about Trump, that they were doing this in view of the incapacitation of a future president. Now, who might that be except the uh, president-elect with his advancing dementia? And so I think that the uh, ground has been paved for Biden to be ushered off the stage rather quickly, and Kamala Harris, who is Obama's protege, to take his place. Who's worse? Who's going to be worse? Biden or Kamala Harris? It's all the same. Much of, much of a muchness. Biden was supposed to be a moderate, but he had to sell his soul to the socialist wing of the party in order to secure the nomination. Uh, the party's choice in 2020, as in 2016, was Bernie Sanders, an avowed socialist, who insists that the socialism he plans to implement in the United States will be that of Sweden, uh, not that of uh, the Soviet Union. But uh, there are already disquieting indications that that is not the case. There has been a, a large number, a quite surprising number of influential Democrats who have already called for truth and reconciliation commissions, as yes. they call it, including Robert B. Reich, who was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton cabinet. And they uh, make it clear that they want to make sure that people who supported the Trump administration will not be able to find work, will not be able to do anything in life unless they uh, apparently attend these truth and reconciliation brainwashing sessions and renounce their former positions in a way that's acceptable to the new authorities. So this is paving the way for a totalitarian state. And there are quite a large number of Democrats saying this, and they're quite open about it. This is, I mean, this is not America. What you're describing is not America. A truth and reconciliation committee. I mean, it's we have committees here set up by Sadiq Khan, you may be aware of, in London, to review our street signs and our, our statues and get them all diversified. But we, our countries are being absolutely transformed by these people, absolutely transformed. And what does a Biden, in your view, Robert, what does a Biden presidency or a Harris presidency mean for Europe? What are, uh, we had a, there was a huge impact when Trump won. Our side got really confident. Will the opposite happen with, with Biden? Yes. Uh, this is a tremendous defeat for the so-called populist movement, the uh, attempt to reassert national sovereignty over internationalist, socialist, uh, initiatives. This, uh, there's, there's no minimizing that. Uh, I wish that it weren't so, but I do think that it, it, it can't be said that these uh, movements are just going to go away. And the more oppressive that the internationalists and socialists become, the more resistance they're going to encounter. And then, of course, they will uh, I'll use that resistance to clamp down all the harder and it's uh, it's it's not going to be pretty on either side of the Atlantic, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. I, unfortunately, I agree, and it's it's not a very positive picture at the moment. But as you say, those seventy million who voted for Trump are still there. We still have a, I think, growing number of people not willing to vote along these grounds yet, mind you. I'm not sure they have the right people to vote for. But I'm still optimistic, and I remain optimistic that the truth cannot be hidden forever. Uh, last question, Robert, if I might, what do you advise us? So our members are sitting watching. What do you advise in general? How do we fight this? What, what, what can any individual do? I know you're asked this question all the time, but I also know it's the question the members want me to ask you. What do you advise them? What can they, they do? Because they always ask me. So I, I'm asking you, <laughs> what can they do? Recruit five more members for For Britain.
Don't be afraid to speak your mind. I know the situation is very dire, but if we're not willing to take any risks to preserve freedom, then we'll certainly lose it. And so one of the main things that uh, people in the UK can do now is try to awaken their friends and neighbors to the magnitude of what's happening and to bring them into your movement. Uh, the the uh, authorities, of course, may make it very difficult for you for doing that. But what are they going to do if you don't do that? They're going to do exactly the same thing without any resistance. And I think that... Uh, there's no doubt, as you just noted, that there is a tremendous amount of support for the positions that we espouse among the general population. They're just not aware of how bad things are. They're not aware of what's going on. And they're not aware that there is a group that is their voice. And so uh, this is what we need to work on, is raising awareness in every possible way that we can, in every forum that we can, and speaking out without any fear, without any hesitation, understanding that the pressures are only going to increase, but the pressures are going to increase because the establishment is so threatened and because the establishment realizes how tenuous their grip on power is. So let's work to, to tip it over the edge and destroy their hegemony forever. Well, Perfect, perfect advice, Robert. Absolutely perfect. And you are right. It's people are with us. They just don't know. They don't know. Uh, so we've got to tell them. Robert, thank you ever, ever, ever so much for joining us again today. Um, I won't keep you for very much longer. But any any final any final thoughts on this? Um, I'd really appreciate any any thoughts at all on the future, where we're going. Um, Anything positive, anything to, to leave us with? Well, I think that that's the thing that we need to keep in mind, that the people who voted for Brexit, even though this has all worked out and such, become such a mess, they voted for it and they're still there. And there will be another occasion coming rather soon, I expect, in which they will be challenged once again to stand up for Britain, for British values, for the values of Western civilization, and uh, they're going to come out in force again. So we need to keep going and never give up hope. Remember, you've got Churchill behind you, and you know the situation looked quite dismal for him at uh, various points during the war, and yet he, uh, above all, counseled perseverance. And so that's what we need to keep in mind at this point. Thank you, Robert. That's absolutely inspirational and perseverance to me is everything there's never been a victory over the odds without perseverance and without faith and without believing we can do it uh, and we can and thank you very very much for, for for joining us today thank you very much for your inspirational words and i mean that and thank you for everything you do for this fight you're one of the people who inspired me to get involved in this um a long long time ago and i thank you for that um, and I thank you for, for, for continuing, for persevering, for fighting, and for being one of the few that we can look to and say, look, look what happens when we fight on. Look at what we, we have intelligent, inspirational people on our side. And you're very much one of those figures to me. And I personally thank you um, thank for inspiring me to get up and, and fight back. Um, okay. So thank you very much, Robert Spencer. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy that, everyone. It's absolute absolute pleasure to have Robert Spencer with us. Um, I shall let you get on with the rest of the conference um, and remember those words. Never, ever, ever give up. This battle is still in front of us, but we still have the truth on our side. People know we are true. They know we're fighting for truth and of love for our own culture and our own people. And we can only win if we persevere. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone, for watching.
So I was asked by the party chairman, would I talk to you about the media? And sometimes I think that's about the only thing I get to talk to you about, the media. But of course, the media is the message, as was once famously observed. And the message I get from the media is that it's so toxic and so poison that it almost staggers belief. You know, when we when we gathered last year and talked about, uh, amongst other things, the, the British media, I guess my expectations of it were that it had sunk pretty low and couldn't get any lower. I was wrong. Of course it could get lower. What was I thinking? The intervening 12 months has seen the British media once again effortlessly demonstrate how destructive it is, how dangerous it is, how um, utterly useless it is as well. Uh, there's been two things, I suppose, in the past 12 months that I wanted to talk to, talk to you about. The first, of course, is COVID-19. You can't get away from the topic. It's dominated our lives. And uh, it's also caused so much damage to our society, caused so much damage to individuals' health by separating people from their loved ones, from their family, from their older folks. Um, it's caused so much economic chaos. And you would think that there would be some kickback from the legacy media when it comes to what the government, in my opinion, foolishly has been indulging in, namely putting us under veritable house arrest. But no, the purpose of the British media is to encourage the government to go even further in terms of its draconian measures against us, in closing us down, in stopping us gathering, in stopping our free assembly. And in a way, it, it shouldn't surprise me, but it does. You know, you've seen, you've witnessed the uh, the many press briefings, especially back in March, April, uh, that when Boris was giving them with uh, Dr. Doom and uh, Professor Gloom uh, on, on, on COVID. And the uh, the only questions we ever seem to get from the likes of Robert Peston, from Laura Kunzberg, uh, from the other dreadful uh, range of uh, media personalities was, could you not lock us up quicker, please? Could you not shut us down faster? Could you not please take away more of our liberties? That's pretty much the line that they were using. Why was that? Why do you think the media have been so keen to see us locked down? Well, I'll give you two reasons, and let me know if you think this, this rings true or not. The first reason is, have you seen the amount of money that the government's been spending on PR campaigns for its uh, PR campaigns on in press and on TV and on radio? It's run into tens of millions of pounds. And those campaigns therefore generate great revenue for the very media that argue for a more lockdown. Do you see how this one works maybe? So in actual fact, lockdowns make the media more profitable. So of course they want to see more lockdowns. Heaven forbid you get to get out and live your life uh, outdoors, away from the box in the corner, away from the, uh, you know, the, uh, the digital radio. That's the first reason. The second reason is this, if you are locked down, that means you're sitting at home most likely. If you're sitting at home, you will consume more media. Now, it may be TV, it may be radio, it may even be online digital, but however, whichever way you cut it, you consume more media. So the media wins. So from both perspectives, COVID has been a blessing for our rancid toxic media. They um, patently can't get enough of it. And that's why even as we, as we gather uh, at this party conference, it's all about when's the next lockdown coming. And the media basically carp and criticize the government if the government, for whatever reason, dilly-dallies and doesn't work out. Well, we have to extend the lockdown for an extra couple of weeks. We've got to stick you in tier three, or is it tier four? Maybe tier five if you live in the People's Republic of Scotland. Uh, and as for Wales, probably the least said the better. And so the, the, the media has a vested interest in keeping the COVID hysteria going. It makes them money. It gets them viewers and listeners. And that's why they are so contemptible, because what they're not doing is doing their job. 
instead of asking probing questions uh, of the politicians, like a decent journalist should do, they don't do any of that. And so we never uh, we, we never get questions asked about what is the false positive rate prime minister. We don't get those questions. Prime minister, do you know that respiratory de uh, illnesses do tend to come back in the autumn? Really simple stuff, never asked, and it never will be asked because that's why that's because they are fake news media. Now, the person who's probably most famously coined that phrase, fake news media, is President Donald Trump. And even in the past couple of weeks, we've also seen the media once again um, go, to dem go to some lengths to demonst demonstrate its outrageous bias against the president in terms of what's happened in the U.S. presidential election. So, you know, within 12 hours of the uh, polls closing, we had the media here gushing that it's going to be President Biden, yeah, orange man, bad, my Trumpfler thrown out of uh, the, uh, the White House. Pathetic partisan stuff, clearly demonstrating endemic bias. And, you know, whether one is a Democrat or a Republican, the fact of the matter is that as of today, Donald Trump remains president of the United States. Oh, now, I know Facebook doesn't think that because they've, remo they've removed that status from him. But he is. Yet the legacy media have shown him no respect. And that's before we get near the dreadful Silicon Valley tyranny of Twitter and of Facebook and indeed of YouTube. Uh, Twitter and, uh, seems to spend its entire time now basically fact-checking every comment that Donald Trump uh, tweets. And they're doing that to damage the president. Facebook, as I said, have removed his status as current U.S. president. It doesn't get worse than that. And let me tell you, if that's how they treat an, uh, a sitting president, what chance have the rest of us? Is it any wonder I was removed from my Twitter perch earlier this year? Of course not. But I'm in good company with the likes of Anne-Marie. We, uh, we prosper without necessarily the weight of Twitter behind us. Uh, another toxic uh, media channel that uh, I'd love to see taken down, actually. I think it does much more harm than good um, these days. So, um, you know, the, the, so whether it's traditional media in the form of TV and radio or whether it's new media in the form of the big Silicon Giants, uh, Silicon Valley Giants, it's all it's all fated. It's all the swamp. You want to know where the swamp is? Turn on your box. Turn on the TV. Flick to the BBC, flick to Sky, go on to Twitter, go on to Facebook. You're in the swamp. That's what needs to be understood. But listen, I want to give you some hope. I don't want this to be just a, a negative diatribe from me. Um, I think there is hope. I think when it comes to the likes of social media, we now have platforms emerging like Parler, where you can still find me, by the way. Yes, I still do exist. Um, you can, there's other platforms coming along like Rumble, which is an alternative, for example, to YouTube. Uh, and this, there's a connection to Parler there. Uh, there are other channels uh, propping up, uh, popping up around the place. And these are new, th these are the successors to big tech. And I wish them every success and I will give them every help I can because I believe that, you know, when we look back in the, from the, in the year 2030 and we look back to 2020, we'll remember that as the year when big tech overreached itself and started a downward spiral. And we look back in it and we'll see that even at 2020, we saw that big media, the BBC, for example, was dying and it'll be dead by 2030. So on the, so I look forward to trampling on the grave of uh, big media and uh, and big tech. Now, that might take a few years, but hopefully I'll still not be in mine. But on the basis that I'm not, uh, I think there is hope. And, you know, the sun does rise afresh every morning. That's what keeps political parties going, because there's always hope. And so 
as I say, I think that we can, with a degree of optimism, face the future, knowing that there will be new innovation, new entrepreneurs, new ways to communicate with each other and to spread uh, the very interesting views of the For Britain Party. And in that regard, can I take this opportunity to thank you again very much for affording me this platform on your special day. And I hope perhaps in 2021, we actually can get physically back together again. And I look forward to that day. In the meantime, thank you all again. One of the things about For Britain is that whilst it is a proudly patriotic British party, the values that it stands for carry resonance right around the world. And so I'd like to now introduce our next guest speaker uh, all the way from Germany. Please welcome Michael Schreiner. Hello, dear members and supporters of For Britain. My name is Michael. I live in Germany. I am German. And I was asked to give a short speech to your national conference, which unfortunately has to take place online this year because of COVID-19 restrictions. I was asked to do this because a few months ago I decided to become an international member of For Britain. And these days I received an email with the question if I want to tell you a little bit of the story of that. So here we go. Um, I am a huge fan of Morrissey for more than 20 years and I didn't know for Britain and Anne-Marie Waters before Morrissey started supporting her and later uh, supporting her party. I must admit that at first I was irritated about this because when you do some research via Google for example you find out that for Britain would be a racist party, would be a far-right party according to Wikipedia for example. And I thought by myself, this can't be. This brilliant musician, who has shown so much common sense over decades, now supports far-right racists. And I'm really aware that nowadays some people are very quick with accusing others of being racist or far-right just because of having an opinion, a different opinion on several issues. And I'm really aware too that Morrissey himself is being accused of being racist already in the early 1990s. So I decided to do some research by myself and real research doesn't mean um, go to Google because this leads you very quick to pages like Hope Not Hate. I guess I don't have to talk about this organization here. Now real research means get in touch with the people you want to know something about. So it started with watching some videos with uh, going to Anne-Marie's live stream, where I asked her different questions. She answered these questions very kindly, so thank you for that. I had very nice conversations uh, with uh, supporters and members in the live chat below the live streams. And I really quick found out that this is interesting, that this is quite sympathetic, and that this is nothing that I would consider as racist or far-right. So in the next step, I decided to read this book, which you surely know. And I must say, it's very well written. It includes very much, um, very many um, facts and data. It's a good work on the issue of what Islam causes in Western societies. And also in this book, I couldn't find anything what I would consider as far right or racist. In the following days and weeks I got in touch with more and more members of For Britain and my conclusion is that your policies aren't far right, your policies are about defending democracy, they are about defending liberties, they are about defending the equality of men and women for example, uh, about defending homosexuals, about defending uh, Jews against uh, anti-Semitism and as you know anti-Semitism is a part of the Islamic ideology. It's about defending animal, animals against the cruelty of unstant slaughter and so on and so on. This isn't far right, this is quite the opposite if you want. 
Well, I had more and more conversations with uh, for Britain members and one person one day told me there will be the opportunity to become an international member. I first thought, well, this is weird as a German citizen to become a member of a British party. But then I gave it a thought. And I thought that um, freedom-loving Europeans should stand together, that you have a manifesto that I can really, really support, and that, in my opinion, England and the United Kingdom are very, very important for whole Europe, even though you left the European Union, or even because you left the European Union, because you gave us an example to liberate a state, a, uh, yes, a society, from this ruling uh, European Union. And my opinion is that if for Britain will be successful in uh, several elections, then this will make an impact on whole Europe. And this is why I think that your success will be so important. And this is why I decided to take the advance, accept the invitation and become an international member of your party. So that's it in summary. I wish you a um, successful conference. I hope we will meet someday in person when this COVID-19 lockdown mask wearing madness is gone. I really hope that it will be gone someday. Uh, by the way, it's another point where I strongly, strongly agree to your political opinions. I wish you all the best. Regards from Germany. Take care and until then. The For Britain Party doesn't shy away from discussing the issues that so many other parties choose to ignore. Now, we all know that female genital mutilation is a savage practice that has got no place in any civilized society, and yet we have it here. And so to give us an update on this uh, crucial issue, might I welcome to the, uh, to the conference floor, Julian Flynn. Welcome, Julian. Hello. I want to share with you some thoughts about female genital mutilation in Britain and what we can do to eradicate it. Female genital mutilation, FGM for short, is an Islamic practice. And despite having neighbours with larger Muslim populations, the UK boasts the most victims in Europe. A 2014 government report estimates that there are 170,000 girls and women living with FGM in the UK. This amounts to 1 in 200 of our female population. However, we don't know what proportion of these represents a violation of British law. Home cutting, whereby a girl is cut on British soil, and holiday cutting, whereby the girl is taken abroad to be cut, uh, are both illegal. Uh, but mutilation that occurred prior to immigration to Britain is not prosecutable in the UK. And it is often impossible to determine uh, which took place, ho home cutting, holiday cutting or pre-immigration cutting. But the 170,000 figure is certainly an underestimate. FGM's illegality inevitably leads to under-reporting. But more worryingly, the very bodies and frontline professionals responsible for reporting and recording FGM have been shamefully negligent in doing their job. For example, a 2013 survey of 500 hospitals and local education authorities found that fewer than 50 kept records of mutilated and at-risk girls and women. We can get a perspective on the problem by comparing Britain's response to female genital mutilation and its response to child sexual abuse. The two crimes are very similar. Both are perpetrated against children, usually by parents or relatives who are otherwise law-abiding. Both play on the victim's loyalty, fear, confusion and shame to make her complicit with the crime. Both crimes target the genitals and the families of the victims of both crimes are often close rank in order to prevent detection by unwelcome outsiders. However, a crucial difference is that FGM is much easier to detect than child sexual abuse because by its very nature it leaves permanent, easily verifiable physical damage, whereas sexual abuse generally doesn't. 
but this is not reflected in the prosecution rates of the two crimes. In the period 2016 to 2017, there were over 7,000 prosecutions for child sexual abuse, re uh, resulting in 5,374 convictions. During the same period, the NHS attended to over 9,000 cases of FGM. And as we have already noted, not of all of these will represent a crime against UK law, a proportion almost certainly having occurred prior to the victim's immigration to Britain. But 57 were recorded as home cutting, and one would have expected these at the very least to have been prosecuted. But no. Instead, only one single one of these 9,000 plus cases was prosecuted, a non-Muslim woman. And this is the only successful prosecution for FGM ever to have occurred in the UK. Yet, FGM should be much easier to detect than child sexual abuse, and certainly no harder to prosecute. So, whilst we rightly prosecute all cases of child sexual abuse, it seems that FGM is rarely investigated or prosecuted, the authorities opting for a softly, softly community-led approach, unless, of course, the perpetrator happens to be a non-Muslim. An example of this softly, softly approach is that of the eight specialist support clinics that opened last year in Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds and London. Uh, to treat a total of about 1,300 women for the long-term effects of genital mutilation. That such clinics have become necessary is in itself an indication of the size of the underlying problem. It, it is also significant that these clinics treat only long-term effects and women, not children. In fact, these clinics do not admit under 18s. Uh, their purported justification being that under 18s will be deterred from seeking their services by mandatory reporting regulations uh, by which professionals must report all suspected cases of child abuse to the police. But surely the biggest obstacle to under 18s accessing these clinics is the fact that these clinics don't admit them. <laughs> the real reason for this policy is not mandatory reporting but rather that they believe his crimes should not be dealt with punitively and they don't want to find themselves obliged to report cases of mutilated little girls to the police. But FGM is a crime against a child long before it becomes a crime against the woman she grows into. Uh, these clinics will alleviate the symptoms of a tiny minority of victims years, decades after the crime was actually committed. But because the perpetrators need fear, no punishment, nor stigma. They will do nothing to actually prevent the crime being committed in the first place. They will mitigate the symptoms when, and only when, they inconveniently make themselves known, giving the illusion that the problem has been dealt with. The impunity with which FGM is treated is an example of Muslim privilege. Muslims consistently demand often with violence, exemptions from the laws and norms that apply to everyone else in society. Laws and norms concerning the treatment of children, animal cruelty, the concealment of identity in public, gender equality, freedom of speech, polygamy, sexual slavery and bonded labour, as we recently saw in Leicester. The UK authorities have gotten into the habit of granting these exemptions either legally, as with halal slaughter and Sharia courts, or by covering up and turning a blind eye to certain crimes when committed by Muslims, for example, grooming gangs and, of course, FGM. These cover-ups may have their origins in fears of accusations of racism, uh, but they are now principally motivated by fear of how non-Muslim British citizens will react if informed of the true nature of Islam and how it is damaging our society. These cover-ups are rationalised as protecting vulnerable minorities, that is Muslims, from Islamophobia, that is a justified and proportional outrage over the rest of the population. However, in turning a blind eye to these crimes and concealing them, from the public, the most truly vulnerable minorities of all are abandoned to the depredations of Islam, Muslim children in the case of FGM and non-Muslim children in the case of Islamic grooming gangs. Frontline professionals, 
such as nurses, social workers, doctors and teachers, can also become complicit with the illegal practices of the communities they work with. For example, a nurse working with Somali immigrants knows that if she reported every suspected case of FGM, uh, she would soon lose their trust, cooperation and, and custom. With the help of a cultural relativism endemic to such professions, they are lured into rationalizing, excusing and turning a blind eye to practices such as FGM. So what policies should Britain adopt to combat female genital mutilation? Um, a central agency devoted to this task should draw up a list of high-risk countries and communities. Uh, a GP, nurse or other qualified person should carry out a yearly check on girls from these countries and communities. This very brief examination can be conducted as an adjunct to other health consultations and be used to inform the parents of the law and penalties. These examinations will be compulsory up to an age determined by informed experts and agencies, uh, probably somewhere between six and puberty. Older girls from high-risk communities will continue to be monitored by other less intrusive means. The daughters of newly arrived immigrants belonging to high-risk groups will be automatically examined and her parents informed of the illegality of FGM. All mutilated girls will be offered medical and psych psychological support. If a previously intact girl is found to have been mutilated, the parents will be investigated and prosecuted. Parents who fail to cooperate will disqualify themselves from certain state benefits and failure to cooperate may also be taken as an indication that their daughters are at risk and may trigger an investigation. Professionals who come into contact with children from high-risk communities will be trained to recognise signs of FGM. They will be obliged to report all cases or suspicions of FGM, including the intention to carry out FGM. Midwives and obst obstetricians, especially, must report all mutilated expectant mothers, including mutilation that happened before immigration, since the daughters of mutilated mothers are at the highest risk of eventually being mutilated themselves. Parents in a high-risk group travelling abroad will be warned that if on their return their daughter is found to be mutilated, they will be prosecuted and prosecutions should receive as much publicity and coverage as possible in order to educate, deter and shame potential perpetrators and their communities. We know that these measures work. In the mid-80s, France implemented a zero-tolerance approach similar to the one outlined above. Before they took this approach, the daughters of mutilated mothers faced um, an 80% probability that they too would eventually be mutilated. By 2014 there had been some 40 highly visible trials for FGM related crimes with over 100 convictions. This sent out such a strong signal to at-risk communities that by 2014 Linda Weil Curiel, an attorney with a pivotal role in these trials, could report we have a triple approach preventing through education, shaming with publicity and punishing. It seems to work. We see girls who are cut before they come to France, but we have not seen anyone cut in France for a while. France has shown that zero tolerance works. But, deluded into thinking we can appease Islam, muddle-headed with cultural relativism and disarmed by cowardice, the UK has adopted an approach to FGM that can be best described as maximum tolerance. Zero tolerance of FGM is long overdue in the UK. I believe that For Britain is a party to deliver it. Thank you. Of course, the purpose of any political party is to win elected office. And as you know, there are council elections coming along next May. And so with that in mind, I would like to introduce to you uh, Miriam Sohill, hope I've pronounced your name right, Miriam, who's 
uh, for Britain regional organizer and a counselor. And what she's going to do is she's going to talk to you how, about how you get ready for fighting a council election. So please welcome Miriam. Hello, I'm Miriam Sohow and I'm the Full Britain Party Secretary and the Regional Organiser for the East of England. Uh, we're coming up to that time of year again where we're preparing for the elections in May, so campaigning is underway. Uh, people have been leafleting um, when, when lockdown has been allowing that and engaging online, um, in sort of social media, local community groups and sort of get basically preparing um, for the elections, get, getting our name out there. So I, I stood last year as a candidate. I've never done this before and um, I quite enjoyed the process really. I found my uh, local authority quite helpful. They've got a, a department that deals with everything to do with the elections. So you can phone them to get any sort of help that you need. Um, I think there was one day where I actually phoned them about four, four or five times asking them questions when I was filling out the form just to be, to be sure and they, they were very helpful when we um, took our forms in. Uh, there was someone there to sort of meet us and actually went through the forms with us. So I, I, I actually found the process quite, quite straightforward. So some of the things that come up, uh, some of the concerns that come up when uh, people are saying they've, they've thought about becoming a candidate is, is just this, the whole process of, of sort of the, the application. I think we have a tendency to sort of build it up in our head like, a, like it's a, a big deal, you know, that you've got this paperwork and you need to get signatures and then, then there's the vote. But remember, it's actually just a few small little steps. Um, it's not this, this one big thing in one go. So, so the first thing, you, you get your paperwork. That's, that's quite simple. Um, and the second thing is you fill it out. It's, it's quite simple. Um, again, there's, there's people there to sort of help. Obviously, we would help as well, um, of course. So that's, that's just very straightforward. Then you need to get your 10 signatures. I managed to do that on just one small street. Usually people are quite happy, happy to oblige. And then you, you hand your paperwork in. It's, it's really, really quite simple. Then campaigning, that's, that's another side of it. So depending on, on how much time you have and, and whatnot, that's, that's completely up to you. But campaigning is, is you know, door to door leafleting. And again, your local branch will help you. You've got plenty of members out there that want, want to help out. And um, on, engaging online, that's another way to get your name out there and to get, to get known. So last, last time round, uh, last year, the party was only just, just over a year old, just, just over a year. And we put forward over 50 candidates and we, two of them were successful. So we have those two councillors. Uh, on top of that, we also had another eight uh, parish councillors. So in total, that's, that's 10 councillors in our first year, which I think is, is quite an achievement and something to be quite proud of. Now, next time round, we're going to be putting forward even more candidates, and we've actually well, we've actually got um, we've we've uh, got more parish councillors now. Since lockdown began, we have about four or five more parish councillors, and we've also had about another six branches open up. So we've been very busy. Um, so next time round, um, you know, the, the coming up elect May, May elections that are coming up, have a think about whether you would like to be a full Britain candidate. Because we often um, hear the phrase "drain the swamp," and we, we you know, we, we see what's going on. We see that we're not being listened to. Uh, you know, our MPs and our councillors are, are not representing, um, not re representing us. We, we've seen the, the absolute fiasco with, you know, the sort of border force. Uh, how lockdown's been handled. How Brexit's been handled. And and yes, yes, we must drain the swamp. But who, who are we going to replace these people with? Well, that's people like you. So, you know, if, if you're thinking, well, you know, you don't know much about it. Every councillor that's there at one point in their, in their, in their life or one, one point in time, they were a new councillor and they didn't know either. But it's just something that, you, you know, you would learn as you go along. So if you win... You know, you'll start going to meetings, you'll start getting emails, you know, it, it will be a gradual process. And again, we're always here to help. Not once have I needed support or help from the party and not got it. 
so so we are here we've got you know like i said we've got counselors established counselors on hand that would be more than happy to to give you advice so don't don't get too caught up in thinking you know what if and you know we often major in minor things but if i if i was told oh there's a new counselor in your area but they're they're not very experienced but they really care about their community and they want to listen to the people and they want what's best for the people and you know they're willing to learn and they've got you know this this passion and enthusiasm that's that's what i want to hear it, it doesn't matter to me whether someone's been a counselor for a year for 10 years or, or is brand new as, as long as they're going to do what they're elected to do if they if they've got that that drive and that willing willingness to learn and they're going to represent us fairly that's what i want so if if you're that kind of person and you you think you know oh you know i might i've thought about becoming a candidate but I'm, i don't know and i'm not experienced as long as you have that that genuine desire to help your community and, and do what's right, that's where it starts. Everything else you can learn as you go along. So have a think about standing. If you want to you know, talk about this more or you've got more questions, get, get in touch with the party. We'll put you through to the right people. We've got, we've got a lot of experienced people sort of from the, sort of the application side and, and, and counsellors, as I've said. But it's it's uh, you know it's it starts with people like you. It's people like you sitting at home, watching this on your on your laptop or your phone. Um, it's you that can make the changes. It's you that knows what your area needs and what your community needs. So thank you for listening to me today. I really appreciate that, and I really appreciate the support that you give the party. We couldn't do it without you. So have a think about becoming a candidate and enjoy the rest of the conference. Take care. My favorite moment of every For Britain conference is the moment that we're gonna have right now. And that is, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the most courageous people I know, not just here in the UK, but anywhere. She speaks her mind, she tells it like it is, she's fearless in the face of great adversity, and it's an absolute pleasure to call her a friend. Please welcome your party leader, Anne-Marie Waters, as she introduces the new party manifesto. Anne-Marie. Well, good afternoon, everyone. You're very welcome, and I hope you're enjoying the virtual For Britain conference of 2020. Now, as a starting point, I have to thank a lot of people. First of all, our members, and thank you very much to you all. Now, you're going to hear this a lot as we approach the end of 2020, and I probably say it at every year's conference, but what a year we have had. It has been a defining year, a world-changing year, a year when we have all been tested. We've been locked in our homes, placed in the most unnatural and often bizarre situations. But our members, as usual, responded with nothing but stoicism and determination, and we got on with it. We had to change what we do, but we just got on with it. And that's our party in a nutshell. It's meet the challenges and do what needs to be done and you have done that this year thank you thank you also to our wonderful committee who work so hard you have such loyalty to our party and our cause that it is genuinely heartwarming i'm very very lucky to have this team around me and i know it i want to thank our donors our supporters and our friends and i hope and I know that we've done you proud in 2020, just as we did in 2019. And as we will continue to do, we'll continue to grow, we'll continue to prosper. We'll do the same and better in 2021, no matter what the obstacles may be. Now, it's been a transformational year for me personally. I've moved to a new home, to a new town, put down some new roots, and I couldn't be more delighted about it. 
This year I moved to the wonderful town of Hartlepool where our fantastic councillor Karen King does us proud, as does Julian Leppard in Epping Forest and our co-opted councillors all around the country and I am sincerely grateful to you all. Now, Hartlepool is a beautiful beachside town that like the rest of our country deserves better. And like in the rest of our country, the hard working people, the people who get out of bed and try and make an honest living are the ones for whom life is hardest. Excessive taxes and regulations have strangled local economies for years, but this year small business took one hell of a blow. And sadly, it's not over yet. So let's take a look back. This year was, of course, dominated by one issue, coronavirus or COVID-19. It is and was the science fiction film that I regularly talk about. It's a bad film. We have been locked in our homes. We've had police threatening to search our supermarket trolleys. We've had the spectacle of the Home Secretary telling us we can't talk to our neighbours. A bad science fiction film and one that came, that began at the start of the year. This all began in January when we began to see images and stories coming out of China telling us that a new virus had arrived and was killing people. This had apparently come from one of China's notorious wet markets, which are soon were reopened and are operating again today. Soon those images arrived in Europe, particularly Italy, and the press ramped this up, hyped it up. Governments felt obliged to take drastic measures, and we initially supported those drastic measures. But even at a time when this virus was spreading, the planes were still landing and our politicians, our political class, was talking about racism. To blame this on China would be racist. It was absurd. What happened next was a masterclass in how we are governed. And this, to me, is key for 2020. The brightest light to shine this year was the light on how we are governed. It has become clearer than ever before. So let me explain. In March, we were placed into what has become known as lockdown. This meant that all non-essential businesses were closed, all leisure facilities were closed, pubs, bars, restaurants, theatres, gyms, all closed. It cut off people from their social lives, from the clubs and societies and churches. It was a severe measure and it was a lot to ask the people. Now, most of the country went along with it. We gave the government our support. Most people stuck to the rules. Even though it was so difficult, we did our best. But as time went on, stories started to emerge and things began to look rather different. There appeared, first of all, to be no immediate end in sight. What we were being told wasn't necessarily what we were seeing. We were told that our NHS was overwhelmed, and yet we saw doctors and nurses with very little to do. They had little to do while cancer patients and others had their vital appointments, tests and treatments cancelled. So what was going on? Then we heard about the care homes. Tens of thousands of people died unnecessarily because COVID patients had been placed into care homes. And the very establishments that are home to the people most vulnerable to COVID-19. We began to learn of deaths registered as coronavirus deaths even when they weren't. We began to hear from doctors and scientists who believed that the defeat of COVID was to be found not in lockdowns, but in medicines currently available. These doctors were silenced. Their jobs lost, their careers lost. Why? What was going on? 
And understandably, public support began to wane, especially when we heard of the economic impact. In my own region, the North East, the city of Newcastle was set to lose 75% of its small businesses. They couldn't survive for so long with no custom. They were driven to the edge and are still being driven to the edge to near extinction. The government provided financial support, but this will only do so much. Businesses need business. And still today, all these months later, they still don't have that business. We are locked down again. And despite all the damage caused, the government repeats the same strategy. Lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. While dissenters are silenced. One of the great lessons in how we are governed can be found here. The government has pursued one solution only. That solution has been lockdown followed by vaccination. That's the only route out of this mess, at least according to our government. But what if it isn't the only way out? Why aren't we looking for alternatives? A for Britain government would long ago have done just that. Our motivation only is to give the British people their lives back. We will not be led by the wishes and demands of big drug companies or the U UN or the EU or Bill Gates, but only to give the British people their lives back, to get our economy back on its feet. That is all that matters and it's all that should matter to a British government. The first major lesson in how we are governed in 2020 is this. Our leaders have decided the direction they will take and they decide it on the basis of what is best for globalism and corporatism, not what is best for the British people. When they've decided their direction, all dissent is crushed. Opposition to government policy has been silenced. We must understand the significance of this. It means we are no longer a democracy. That dream is over. For now. Not that there is much opposition to government policy, certainly not inside the House of Commons. The Labour Party are happy to go along with government policy, no questions asked. The media parrots government policy, no questions asked. The entire system has therefore broken down. In 2020, we are no longer an advanced democracy. We are no longer governed by the will of the people. That is lesson one. Lesson two is this. Our government and our so-called opposition and our corrupted media loathe our national identity. They are all on board with the globalist dream of the breakdown of the nation state. They are all contented to see the end of Britain as we know it. They are all contented to wipe the slate clean and demolish our history and heritage. In tyrannical communist regimes, it's not unheard of to wish to start again, to bring one era to a close and open another one. To do this, such regimes erase history. They ban books, pull down statues, rename streets. All of this is taking place in the UK in 2020 and all of it on the watch of the so-called Conservative Party. This year, Boris Johnson presided over a country that stood helplessly by while its heroes were degraded. Johnson did nothing while the London statue of one of Britain's greatest heroes, Winston Churchill, was so scandalously covered up and he was encased in a metal box. Boris Johnson did nothing while our statues were torn down. He did nothing while the worst mayor of London for a generation decided that he, and he alone, would alter the historical map of our great capital city. One of the great historical cities of the world is about to be transformed by Sadiq Khan. No longer will it reflect Britain. 
Our capital city will no longer be a British city. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson does nothing. Boris Johnson also did nothing about the third great lesson of 2020. We live in a de facto police state. The Coronavirus Act passed in March was the most draconian piece of legislation ever passed. And the police had power they had never had. We were told, again, told not to speak to our neighbours, told not to buy luxuries, told not to hug our families. This was by the police. Absolutely content to intimidate ordinary Brits for merely shopping, the police were equally content to stand by and watch while our memorials were vandalised. No, I'm wrong. They didn't stand by and watch. They got onto their knees in obedience and deference to the very people engaged in the vandalism. The British people need to know, while you were locked down, others were taken to the streets, protesting against your country and all of it with a police escort. The British police are no longer police but the enforcement arm of a state that is using them to control debate and stamp on dissent. That is how we are governed. But it gets even worse. Boris Johnson also did nothing when thousands, yes, thousands of illegal immigrants made their way to the UK via Dover and other ports and were picked up by the border force, taken to hotels, and provided with taxpayers' money. This is happening today as I'm speaking to you. Now, while British businesses crash, unemployment skyrockets, our country is in unprecedented debt, our money is meanwhile being spent to bring thousands of strangers to our shores. While veterans sleep on the streets, strangers are offered bed and board. Boris Johnson does nothing about this, and nor does Priti Patel. That's how we're governed. So let's summarise where we are today. What are the problems and how do we fix them? Now, For Britain's manifesto, released today, has all the answers. They are simple solutions, and they're simple partly because they work. Where are we today? Our businesses are closed. Our Chancellor Rishi Sunak has no idea how he intends to recover our economy. The only ideas so far seem to involve taxing the British people even more. Tax and spend. Is this the solution of a Conservative government or a Socialist one? You'll have to answer that question yourself. British businesses are already overtaxed. British people are already overtaxed. The last thing they need as they try to recover from these lockdowns is more taxes. But that is what they're going to get. Now, For Britain will do the opposite of this. Instead of making life harder for business, we will reroute billions of pounds that would otherwise be wasted into funding tax cuts for small and medium businesses. Let them do business, let them work, let them grow, let them create employment. That's the way out of this crisis. While our economy limps, the immigration continues and our country remains a magnet for criminal people trafficking. For Britain will send back all illegal immigrants and call a halt to this madness. There'll be no immigration for at least five years. We need to take stock. We need to find out who is in our country and how many. And above all, many, many people must be deported. Even our own government has no idea how many illegal immigrants are in our country. That is madness. And that's how we're governed. Now, For Britain will bring this train to a halt. No more gifts from the magic money tree to everyone and anyone. Our money will be spent on the British people first. 
Meanwhile, our heritage is dismantled. And let's be very, very clear about this. For Britain will legislate to prevent the Mayor of London or any council across this country from pulling down statues or renaming streets. How dare they? How dare they attempt to wipe out the history of Britain? We will not stand for this. We will, however, stand for election next May. And we will shout from the rooftops in defence of our statues, our memorials, our historical figures, our heritage and our identity. And for the record, Edward Colston's statue will go back up. The police, they'll get a clean sweep at the top. Policing culture is simply too corrupted for anything less. All the politically correct common purpose mini communists of the policing hierarchy will be removed from their jobs. We'll replace them with people who will enforce just and democratic laws without fear or favour. For Britain will also end this censorship. A vaccination for COVID-19, which the Health Secretary has refused to say whether this will be mandatory or not, is apparently on its way. But don't assume that you are allowed to discuss this vaccination that the government expects you to allow to be injected into your veins. Discussion is forbidden, at least by social media. And if the Labour Party gets, it way, gets its way, it will be forbidden by law. Labour want to criminalise discussion of the COVID-19 vaccination. Imagine that. Don't assume either that you're allowed to discuss climate change. Only one view on this is allowed. We must agree that the planet is in imminent danger of destruction and the only solution is to dismantle the global economy and rebuild it again. This time, of course, with more and more taxes and fewer and fewer freedoms. Build back better is the mantra. Better for whom? Well, for the globalists, for the green corporations, for the mini communists. Whatever is built may be better for them, but it will not be better for us, for the people. But don't expect to talk about it. Discussion on climate change is censored. Now this censorship will end with For Britain once and for all. We will make sure that nobody, not government, not parliament, not the judiciary and not the media can take away our freedom of speech. And speaking of the media, as they can't be trusted to be honest on their own, let's make them honest. For Britain will put a stop to fake news. We will legally oblige the press to tell the truth. And what a refreshing change that will make. The press thought it had every right to call the US election over and done with, even before the votes had been counted. The press needs to be reminded of its role in our society to truthfully inform the people. Now, For Britain will be the party to remind them. But the good news is that never before have we been so awake. Never before have we learned such lessons, such crucial lessons about how we are governed. When illegal immigrants pose a threat to us, and they do, we only need to look at the history of terror attacks in this country and across Europe, including this year, to know that this poses a threat to us. But when this threatens us, our government does nothing to protect us. When our economy teeters on the edge, our government does nothing to protect us. When our history and heritage is torn down and degraded in front of our eyes, our government does nothing to protect us. When our elderly are threatened by a virus we can't control, our government does nothing to protect them. Quite the opposite. When our schools teach our children to hate us, our government does nothing 
to protect us. When our speech is stifled and the police push us around with heavy handedness, our government does nothing to protect us. We know this now and we know it like we've never known it before. The only question now is what we do about it. The answers to this country's problems will not be found among the celebrity class with their single issues or selfish grievances. We do not need glamorous flashes in the pan. What we need is a mass movement of the British people, the workers, the grafters, the builders, the parents, the people who bankroll this country and keep it going. Those are the people who will save it. For Britain is just those people. We are not built on social media. We are built on hard work. The media isn't making us. Therefore, the media can't destroy us. Our place is out there with the people. Involved in local campaigns, sitting on local councils, helping, working, getting things done. That's our party. And it is a party built upon a foundation that cannot be kicked from under our feet because it is ours. And it came from hard work and dedication. Not instant, overnight, but fleeting fame. We will build and build and build. And when the time is right, we will enter Parliament and we will get our country back. People often ask me if it is too late. It is never too late. Britain is still with us. She is still alive. And if those of us who love her come to her rescue, she can thrive once again. But it is up to us, to the people. It's up to us to never lose sight of what we are fighting for and never give up believing in its value. We are fighting for freedom. We are fighting for justice. We are fighting for democracy. We are, of course, fighting for Britain. The journey is a long one, but it is the greatest journey we could ever undertake. We'll do it. We'll do it together. Let's bring our positive pro-Britain attitude forward into 2021 and we cannot possibly fail. Thank you all very much. who he is and it's an absolute honour to have his support. The dog is in the background and it's let her out again, don't thank you.